Um, <laughs> thank you. For me? No. Um, as a consultant, maybe if you booked the panel early, you saw Ursula was supposed to be moderating. So I'm a sub, which means I, I didn't have a suit at the ready, but actually there's a good diversity of styles on stage here, which uh, makes me feel better. So I um, want to introduce the panelists. Here we have Adam, CEO of BitGreen, which combines blockchain technology and green innovation to drive capital into sustainable initiatives. We have Misha, co-founder and CEO of Nodal, a decentralized wireless network that uses an innovative proof of connectivity method to grow. Did I, did I get that? Did I nail that? Yeah, yeah, you did okay. very well. <laughs> and then we have Uli, who is the CEO of the Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute, which helps gauge the climate impact of blockchain projects. Um, so to get started, I'd imagine a lot of people in the audience are like somewhat aware of your organizations and what you do, but I want to challenge each of you to give an elevator pitch. Like, you, you have 30 seconds to, like, get, like, sell Gavin Wood on your concepts. Like, what do you say? Like, how do you give the pitch for what you do? And we're going to go down the line here, starting with Adam. All right. Thanks, David. And yeah. <clears throat> thanks for wearing a button-down collar shirt in uh -huh. my place. Yeah. I'm Adam, CEO of Bitgreen, and we're a blockchain for ESG and sustainability. We're a platform that enables other development teams and corporate, uh, corporate, and, in corporate and institutional entities to utilize blockchain infrastructure as an operating system to, f to advance and further their own ESG and sustainability initiatives. Great. I'd invest. <laughs> <laughs> You're in. <laughs> so I'm the co-founder of Nodal. Uh, we are, um, I'm not going to use the jargon, but basically uh, we enable billions of people to connect to trillions of things and people as well. I like to say that we are all nodes because we all have a smartphone with us, and that's what we do. Basically, we uh, uh, push a s software, an app, on your phone, and uh, when you have this app, which is called Nodal Cash, you basically become a node, and you can connect to things around you, and it's very environmentally friendly, actually, to deploy your wireless networks. It's 100% software, and uh, we start with some uh, business application to help uh, um, businesses locate things, but soon we're going to have more and more social applications uh, built on top of this uh, decentralized platform. Excellent. Last but not least. Hey, everyone. My name is Uli Gallesterfer. I am the CEO of the Crypto Carbon Ratings Institute. Um, we are the leading data provider for um, cryptocurrency sustainability metrics. Um, so we help all um, players along the value chain to understand where their activities may be holding crypto, may be transacting crypto, um, for they, uh, what, what that means for their sustainability goals. We are rooted in academia, so we come from academia and started the um, cryptocurrency sustainability debate in 2018. Great. So let's jump right into that debate. That is the topic of the panel. So one of the things I've noticed, Web3 has become a supercharged space, by which I mean a lot of cynics in particular, I think, conflate Bitcoin and the Ethereum network as it currently stands, uh, they kind of use those as stand-ins for the entire Web3 space. And obviously, as we all know in the room, that is not an accurate description. All the same, given that that seems to be where so much of the public is in terms of how they think about blockchain, given that Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, are so huge, uh, there is a lot of talk about the horrendous climate impact of crypto writ large. And uh, when it comes to Polkadot and, and the people on stage here and, and likely in this room, obviously it's a different model. And I'm curious to ask each of you how we might encourage a more nuanced conversation, more education that will help people understand that there are more environmentally aware paths forward for blockchain development. Who wants to start? Yeah, I think... I think education is a very important topic. So people are not really aware of the multiple um, um, consensus protocols that are out there. So Bitcoin started with it. Ethereum followed suit with proof of work. And I think um, that is a debate that needs to be focused on more. So what are consensus mechanisms? Why do we need them? And um, what, how, how do they work? And with that, we are actually able to understand, OK, um, as long as money is not the um, primary fuel or um, the electricity consumption is not the primary fuel for these networks or for these consensus mechanisms, then we actually don't have any sustainability issues um, when it comes to the E, um, so, to, so to say, to the electricity of these networks. Yeah. Mm. 
Well, maybe we can explain for um, the difference actually between the proof of work and the uh, proof of stake, which is characterized Polkadot, and one of the characteristics of the Polkadot network. Uh, so in proof of work, which is uh, originally used by Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you to create a, a cryptographic proof, basically you need a certain amount of uh, computation, and that's what is consuming a lot of energy, and that's why uh, some people say uh, or that basically these proof of work are not uh, environmentally friendly. I would say I would nuance that because people get more and more aware, actually find new ways to actually uh, use renewable energy to, pro to actually mine Bitcoin, which is great. Uh, and proof of stake, which is what the Polkadot uses, is basically uh, based on creating a proof through having validators where uh, you have a lot of money or cryptocurrency sitting in, in each of these validators and they are validating the transaction. So it's a completely different approach. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why also we chose Polkadot uh, with Nodal and we, we joined the group of Parachain uh, um, actually recently and we migrated just two days ago, our chain to the Parachain to be validated uh, on the, by the whole Polkadot network. All right. This is an awesome question because you use the word nuance, mm. right? And it's an awesome question and this is the perfect container maybe for two reasons. The first is that the conversation around sustainability and environmentalism, or actually generally uh, sustainability in blockchain, requires a multi-dimensional conversation, right. right? Which is a corollary to what many of the people in the room and Polkadot, which has an underlying thesis of multi-chain rather than mono-chain, right? And the conversation around sustainability in blockchain predominantly has been one of proof of work and electricity consumption and then greenhouse gas emission as a consequence of that versus a proof of stake conversation, right? Different forms of consensus. That's actually only one dimension. The other reason why it's such a great question is because we actually have someone in the back wearing a Bitcoin t-shirt in the yellow jacket who's on her phone. But in any event, yeah, it's you, it's great. It's great that you're here so that we can have this conversation together. And the reason why it ought to be nuanced is because there's so much more to this conversation related to sustainability, right. whether that's environmentalism, it's social good, it's governance, whatever that happens to be, financial inclusion, than just the consumption of electricity. And I would kind of use that as a synonym for like a unit of doing bad or like, uh -huh. or right. People often think about sustainability or their greenness as trying to avert or offset the things that they're doing that have negative consequences in their, in their life or in the world, right? right? Like throwing out a plastic bottle rather than recycling cycling it, throwing out your coffee rinds, not composting it, or yeah. not exercising, or, right? or, or surrounding yourself with negativity. So people institute or apply different mechanics and strategies to try to alleviate or avert the negative. And let's just say for a moment that that negativity or that negative output is a unit, a one unit of bad. But I'd argue that sustainability actually is, is imbued with this notion of like, constructiveness and positivity right? mm -hmm. and optimism. So that one unit of bad that we're trying to avert, and that could be a conversation related to like, proof of work mining, or it could be a conversation around like, overfishing. Right? Uh -huh. But the other side, the more nuanced conversation related to sustainability, which is way more interesting, is how to actually do more good rather than doing less bad. Yeah, I, I, I like to That's think about that. I, I think you, you point a very good thing is in this industry, and particularly when you look at all the young teams building on Web3, they already have that mindset set of sustainability and launching projects actually that can have an impact, a positive impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing to see basically all these projects. Right. So that, that does kind of bring me to a question for Uli, actually, and I'm curious if you could tell us about the overall trends you're seeing at CCRI. Are you concerned or optimistic about where things are going? So given that we started um, working and researching in an academic environment 2017, and we started working on the sustainability, uh, sustainability of uh, Bitcoin, and um, that first of all was a lot of media attention on that topic. So it was really, um, there was some discu discussion going on on Twitter, people were interested about that, but that's about it. And I think that narrative changed over the years, and that's also the reason why we are here, is not because we are um, 
because we, 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 um, we, we had this idea ourselves, but because the demand in the industry of the cryptocurrency industry may it be the cryptocurrencies itself, may it be payment providers, may it be exchanges, may it be investors, they raised this issue and say, okay, we are investing here in an asset class or we are dealing with an investment class where we have absolutely no idea about the sustainability metrics of any of these protocols. Mm. And um, you guys, you did awesome research in the past. Can you help us understand what that means for us in terms of accounting? So what is the responsibility of the individual investor? Uh, or what is the responsibility of the, whole, of the whole ecosystem? And I think that um, demand is increasing and increasing. I see. And I'm actually very happy that we are able to um, not only have the discussion on the e side, like on the electricity side of an ESG, but also on social and governance questions, where there is way more to, um, to just discuss about the electricity consumption, which is, which is not an issue with in proof of stake networks, but we will talk about monetary, monetary distribution, inclusion, all these aspects that are also important for a sustainable, a sustainable future for any cryptocurrency. Right. Let's talk about that governance piece for a second here, because I think that's really interesting, this notion that there should be some acknowledgement or awareness that in the context of governance, this needs to be foregrounded to some extent. Sustainability needs to be foregrounded as these application services protocols are developed. How are you, I guess for anyone on this panel, I'm curious about where you see the meaningful intersection of governance and sustainability and what your sense is of, uh, you were speaking to this a little bit, it seems to be that there is a growing awareness, a growing concern around sustainability in this uh, field, but just would love to tease that out a little bit more in the, in the perspective of governance because I think that is so central to the way that we're going to be talking about the development of these technologies moving forward. Well, I can... Um Talk for ourselves, for example, we, uh, we have a lot of possibilities to, of new projects to build on the platform. And one thing we focus now, which actually creates a lot of enthusiasm within our team and people from outside our team who are, want to join the project, is creating a DAO, uh, which is an energy DAO, to enable peer-to-peer -peer sharing of uh, electri electricity charges. Uh, so people would basically rent some of their uh, charging station uh -huh. or use other people's charging station. Cool. And when you see the enthusiasm around that, this, uh, this potential DAO, uh, because the idea is to actually create a, 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 a decentralized autonomous organization for this, it's, it's, it's actually amazing. And a, everyone wants basically to see this happening. Can you tell me why a DAO is necessary for an application like, uh, for a use case like this? Um, well, it's a, it's a great way to have basically all incentives aligned for uh, the people who already have an electric car and want to benefit from the infrastructure, sure. or uh, people who actually have an infrastructure already, which can be retails, not, not necessarily just individuals, and share it with other people. Right. And then you have people who uh, may just want to, to fund such projects. Right. So, uh, and the DAO is a great way to actually align all the interests. Sure, so creating an incentive structure, yeah. essentially. Um, so, or the units of bad versus the units of good and getting the right balance there, which takes me to a question I have for you, actually. Um, when it comes to Big Green, um, I want to ask you, I think we need to hear a little bit more about what Big Green specifically does, but a common criticism of well-meaning green actions in this world is that, listen, climate change, it's out of control. We are well past the point of disaster. Uh, we need widespread fundamental systemic change to actually make any kind of meaningful difference, some would say. Um, and so there are these well-meaning actions like planting trees or buying a carbon offset when you fly to Davos or whatever, but a lot of people say it's a drop in the bucket. People kind of roll their eyes at things like that. Um, tell us how you think about that criticism in the context of what you're doing at Big Green, or if you think that's a fair characterization at all. I think the criticism could be correct, mm -hmm. uh, sadly, right? The criticism, which I think that you're enumerating, is the problem is so pervasive and so large that potentially on an individual basis, like our individual actions don't matter, like not even a blip on the radar screen or a drop in the bucket. 
and to an extent that's actually true, and I'll just provide the math on climate change as just one microcosm and one issue of the entire sustainability debate, but it just happens to be like the proxy for all the other conversations that we're having. Sure. <clears throat> the math of climate change is very, very simple. The more carbon dioxide or the more molecules of greenhouse gas per parts per million in the atmosphere, the greater the level of global warming. And that rate has been accelerating in literally an exponential manner in the last 100 years. And more and more, given that there's existing carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the air, and we keep belching more into the air. The math is really simple. Uh, climatologists, researchers, and other scientists tell us that within the next 10 years, by 2030, so less than 10 years, seven and a half years away, the globe, and plus or minus two, or, or you know, maybe five years, reaches what's this point of no return, or effectively a global warming lock-in that begins to trigger other accelerating natural feedback loops in the environment that begin to continually heat up the planet beyond our scope of control. That's within 10 years or 15, it doesn't matter what number you want to put on it, it's immediate. The math to kind of staunch, to staunch that, or to try to reverse it, is this. We need to begin removing 22 gigatons, billion tons of carbon dioxide from the air every year by 2030, and then another 20 gigatons every year thereafter. Last year, we emitted 38 gigatons. So that full round trap, that full round trip, it's a trap. <laughs> the full round trip is about 60 gigatons. We're literally moving in the wrong direction. So for better or for, better or for worse, right, your recycling program doesn't really make a difference in that equation, right? It's just so, it's so large. It's the largest, it's basically the largest endeavor that contention that humanity will ever need to contend with estimated to be around like $50 trillion of investment and adaptation. So that just, that's why I think actually the criticism is somewhat correct in that like on an individual basis, both we can't really do anything, but also it's required of us to, to change our entire mentality in a radical manner, right? That's the, that's the paradox, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to do that collectively, which is also why blockchain is such a great fit, right? To respond to this challenge because it actually incorporates collectivism in a major way. And we need to be thinking not in terms of like individual recycling, composting, like we should be driving EVs, yes, and not, not running our cars in the summertime just for air conditioning. All that is important. But we need to be thinking on a different scale. We need to be thinking in the scale of gigatons and trillions of dollars invested, not like small $10 million VC rounds. Right. That's where, and, I'll finish it. This is where Bitcoin comes in, because it's supposed to be an operating system for channeling hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, into sustainability investment. Because any number that we're talking about that doesn't begin with the letter T, like if we're talking about M's, don't, it's not even worth the breath. If we're talking about B's, important, but we need to be thinking at the scale of trillions. Yep. And likely that only a scalable, a scalable technology such as blockchain is required by necessity to help humanity reach that type of scale. Right. Did anyone read that recent Kim Stanley Robinson book? The, Ministry for the Future. Yeah, yeah, Ministry for the Future. Really great. I would, if you're in this audience, like check that book out because a lot of it is actually kind of about. Basically, what you're there about. are numerous startups. Yeah. Bitcoin is one of them that are inspired. Like literally, the genesis of our idea came out of this book. Yeah. Similar to Have how. Have you two read it? No. Nope. Ah, pick it up. We'll get you copies. It is like, yeah. it's the fountainhead of this century. Yeah. Oh wow. Well. Okay, yeah. I see it. It's not that philosophical. <laughs> all right. Um, let's just like, okay, so, well, first of all, what do you two think about what he just said? About the need for, like, Bring it. it sounds like you're kind of making a call to, like, think bigger in a certain sense. To make a, or maybe even more specifically, you're also speaking to the capacity for blockchain to actually be a sort of lever of systemic change when it comes to the ways in which an individual can actually operate and make some kind of positive impact. I'm curious, do you buy what he's selling? Well, I, I, I like your enthusiasm. I like that you want to tackle the problem with the big numbers. I, I, I agree. And uh, after listening to the numbers you mentioned, actually, uh, uh, it makes me even more aware. So uh, I think we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, and I think, yes, the blockchain infrastructure in general is a perfect platform for getting to these numbers and enable this money to flow in the right place. Mm. Uh, the thing is, when it comes to in being inclusive, uh, uh, when you look at the numbers of blockchain and crypto wallets today, 
Mm. Uh, you have like uh, some numbers, uh, I mean, from Andrew Senorovitz lately with their study was 50 million wallets. Uh, you look mm. at other studies that say 300 million wallets. Well, you have 7 billion smartphones on the planet. So we are really just early and at the beginning. And I think this infrastructure you're, you're mentioning that you are aiming for uh, and you want to see happening will happen when you will have actually billions of people with crypto wallets and basically being able to channel uh, money in the right place or take action for the right things and being uh, incentivized to take these actions. And so uh, I'm extremely optimistic because when you see the pace of adoption of new technologies, it keeps on increasing. Right. And I just wish that uh, to reach the trillions, we're going to have a couple billion people uh, actually on board and on the blockchain infrastructure in general in the coming uh, two years, three years. That would be amazing because yeah. when I look again at the numbers, I still see a slow adoption. Uh, I'm much more optimistic. I think uh, when you start to see applications that have virality and become more social and basically make it super easy for anyone to, to join a, or use an application that basically leverage the blockchain and they don't even need to know, then I think this will accelerate and we will be able to maybe to reach these numbers. So, yeah. Right. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully hooked on the idea that um, a blockchain or blockchain networks are required to bring transparency and to scale um, the efforts that we, rec we need to actually come to the point we don't, where we don't have this issue anymore. But also I, th I see when we started with the criticism, I think this is also where we need to have a lot more work in terms of um, carbon credits itself, the voluntary carbon market, uh, what is going on there, what are these credits, are we talking about additionality of carbon offsets? So the idea of like, oh, we're tokenizing some um, carbon credits that come out of a business because they reduce some carbon emissions. But it's the question, would that have happened if there wouldn't be a way to tokenize that? Uh -huh. So um, I think there is, a, there is really a, a need for, for entities that are out there and really ensure that the credits that people are using and trading on these chains are really what they think they are. Uh -huh. And that's, so to say, also with transparency and truth, also with the previous panel, yeah? That's some kind of, uh, we need some kind of auditability and we need some way forward in that regard to be able to manage that better. Which is what your organization does, if I understand, to some um, extent. Not really. So we are not auditing um, the um, carbon credits itself. So we okay. are not looking I, at, yeah. um, like, reforestation projects and say yes. if they are I see, I if see. they are what they're doing. We are looking at cryptocurrencies, we are looking at investments, we are looking at crypto activity and trying to put a number on there. Right. And then our customers can take the number, make it transparent, um, try to mitigate it somehow the, right. by changing um, uh, chains or also the last resort is to offset it, yeah. So we need something that gives additional context to um, these other layers of impact, I guess you could say. Um, let's think big with this group of people. Let's, so we're all, you know, polka dot, it's about interoperability. It's, you know, it's like, let's just do the thing. Let's come up with an idea that solves this right now. I've infected you with the concept of thinking big now. Let's just do it. Yeah. Okay. So like, if we were to be interoperable in this panel, right, and we were to just kind of dream big what is and what would you be interested, what would this group of people be interested in doing next to kind of continue to make progress on the sustainability front or empower people who, these 50 to 300 million wallet holders to make a meaningful impact or to set up the right mechanism for, uh, you know, incentivizing uh, carbon removal or what have you? I have an idea. Let's hear it. So let's say Uli can uh, quantify the impact of certain initiatives uh -huh. in terms of uh, carbon emission. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say Adam can uh, identify great projects or initiatives that can be taken by millions of people. Then we can push them on the nodal platform to uh, the users of our wallet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe that's a great way to work together. OK, that's a start. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> So after this panel, you'll We're make that happen. We're raising a $200 million yeah. valuation. Free yeah. revenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No team. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Well, what's your pitch? What's your pitch? Let's get back to the elevator pitch. What's your pitch? I, I have one, actually. Okay, let's do it. And it's not so far away. Okay. 
one of the one of the primary products that is being built on Bitgreen right now is a technical framework for project financing conservation projects okay. that will ultimately create and mint high quality carbon credits. Right, and a carbon credit is basically a unit of sequestered carbon in the environment. <clears throat> there are some nuances. There are more nuances to that into that market that need to be told right now. But Uli actually. Uh, has the capability of measuring and verifying the consumption of electricity and then, you know, by extrapolation, the carbon greenhouse gas emission from a, from a, from a means of production. So in this case, it is uh, a blockchain, mm -hmm. right? And Misha has the ability, right, through like maybe mesh networking and their technology to actually bring connectivity to people who are using phones all over the world. Within the carbon credits regime, there are one of the major pro problems is verification of the project on the ground, the actual measurements of what's happening, right? Not only as one snapshot in time, like let's say you send an auditor down to the Amazon and they show up with a clipboard and like a measuring tape and they measure the diameter of trees right. and then within a 20 by 20 meter space, they like identify the cross sect, the number of trees, and they multiply that. Like, that's literally the process that happens. Then the auditor leaves, carbon credits are issued, and then they're reissued every year for the next 20 years. There's not a very good cost-effective way to continue to monitor what's happening in that area, right? Has there been a flood? Has there been a fire? Have ranchers showed up to cut down the trees to raise soybeans to feed cattle that become tacos at Taco Bell that we eat, right? right. Some people eat. So, <laughs> right. not so, speak for everyone. Yeah. So there is like there there is a there's a combination right here, and one that I actually think is 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 going to happen because it's part of it is already happening at Polkadot right now. There's a project underway for all of the different parachain teams and for the apps built on top of those parachain teams to measure uh, their their um, electricity consumption and then carbon offset. Right, that's an implementation of what Uli is building. Right, the actual measurement reporting and verification of that consumption. Those carbon credits would then be uh, issued and tokenized and then issued on top of Bitcoin and then burned or retired, which is you know, the, industry, the industry word for retiring a carbon credit, in an ongoing dynamic way that can scale with the scalability and the growth of the Polkadot network. Right. Moreover, the issue that I was talking about, which is the, like, what is happening on the ground? There's no way to really understand that. There's some remote sensing capability coming on with satellites. Uh -huh. But one of the best ideas that's actually been pitched to me is to empower people who live in these very remote places with GoPros and with smartphones. Just wake up every day, go to the same area, and take a picture of, like, 50 to 100 or 1,000 different uh, different locations, right? And then using like some type of algorithm to actually verify that there has not been a massive change in that area. And then via crypto wallets, you can then provide economic inclusion, right? Yeah, and jobs right. to those people. Incentivizing them. Typically, so, the people yeah. who live in these delicate areas are very impoverished, right? And they're, they're exploited by mining companies, illegal loggers, and other entities. Carbon credits is a mechanism, supposed to be a mechanism, that when you buy a carbon credit for 10 bucks, Five or five dollars or so should go back to that community. Sometimes it's a buck. That sucks, right? right? But here's a way, right? Providing connectivity, and then you can't send an auditor in there because, like, they're in some re really remote place of the Amazon. But through we, this so we, connectivity, we actually, we actually did that uh, pre-pandemic, yeah, or the beginning of the pandemic, where we were paying people for staying at home. So basically, <laughs> um, they were receiving right. more rewards for staying at right. home. And uh, yeah, we're gonna bring more and more mission actually on the Nodal Cash app. And uh, I mean, I would love to see how we can make that happen. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think we're all going to be use really case. pissed yeah. off at all of you if you don't make this happen <laughs> after this panel. So like I said, raising. get each other's WhatsApps or whatever. Um, we will move to a Q&A session with the audience in a moment. Um, of course, if y'all don't have questions, I'll keep battering them with mine. But do we have any questions off the bat? Our Bitcoin person left. There we go. Yeah, Bitcoin, she was not into this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, and if, sorry, if you could please introduce yourself, tell us your name and uh, who you're here with, your organization, and then your question, please. Great. <clears throat> Catherine Cunningham, Natural Intelligence. And so this conversation at the end was really interesting, and it also focused on the carbon offset, which was the negative piece of the story. Yeah. So how do we <clears throat> incentivize that positive narrative that... Um, 
they create a coin out of doing good or so, and how do you track it? If you're working with businesses, which I worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, they are so resistant to this greenwashing effect that they don't even want to be recognized for some of the good things that they do. They just know it's good for their industry. Mm. And so how do you um, incentivize, how do you create this positive action in conglomerate in some sort of tokenized way? And then how do you incentivize businesses, which I guess are some of your clients, to really adapt it and adopt it? Adopt it and adapt it. Well, I, I, I think the, the, the day you can quantify actually the carbon impact, uh, then, I mean, that's something that organization starts to buy. So if you uh, generate a lot of good actions that basically can show that you are going to reduce the carbon impact, then, yeah, businesses should be interested even to buy the credits and people should get a share, basically, of that credit that basically has been purchased to, uh, um, because they did a good action. So... I think that's one way. And then, since we are in blockchain and you, we use a lot of different proof, you can generate proof of people's action that can be recorded on the blockchain. Uh, and um, so, yeah, you can prove, for example, that someone was really in a specific location. Uh, and then with the camera, and you can prove that that person took that specific photo, for example. So you can add up all these different proofs that you can create, uh, record them on the blockchain so they are immutable. And this can basically serve the purpose of uh, maybe an organization like a, uh, really to quantify what's the impact uh, and, um, and then organization can, can purchase these credits. I mean, that's just uh, one way. Bitgreen's going to roll the dice, take some chances and see what works. Probably many of, many of those ideas and experiments are not going to work, but such as startups. But I think your question is the, is the trillion dollar question. Uh, it goes well beyond just environmentalism carbon offsetting, greenhouse gas. It's, like, it's way more of a human question. The human question, which is like, how do you encourage people to eat their vegetables instead of just avoiding the donut, right? How do you teach a child to do that? How do you teach students to do that? How do you focus people, like for their New Year's resolution, not to say, like, I'm going to lose the five pounds, 10 pounds, because that's evil and bad. Mm. But I'm going to like, do these really constructive, progressive things in my life. It's hard to motivate people to eat their vegetables, get up do the air squats, stretch, go to bed on time, right? So, air squats, oh my But that's, <laughs> but that's, I think that's at the crux. Like, on a first principles level, it's really what you're asking, in a way. How do you incentivize people to do the right thing? But that's the ultimate question. Like, that's the holy grail question that I'm probably the, one of the most interested in. How do you really inspire people to live better lives? Not to just do less bad, but do more, better, good. I do think there's a silver lining that we're, I mean, you said it earlier, this is early days, and there's a lot of excitement around, is your mic okay? I don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> there's a lot of excitement of, around, oh, here we go. Okay. There's a lot of excitement around this stuff already, which I think is maybe uh, encouraging in that respect, and the eat your vegetables, do your air squats respect, but we'll see. Do we have any other audience questions? This is your chance. Okay. Um, and we still have a few minutes here? Yeah, okay, great. So one of the things that I wanted to ask about additionally, and maybe this is, this could be beyond the purview, right? But we talked earlier, again, the topic of the panel is around this debate, right? The debate being that there is this kind of unsustainable part of the blockchain world, and there is this aspect, which is about sustainability. How do you uplift responsible development in this space, in the Web3 space, without inadvertently supporting the very large portion of the Web3 universe that is not sustainable? By which I mean, well, maybe you understand the question, but it's like, it's easy for us to talk about all of this in, in the polka dot room in Davos, but the Web3 world is big and happening outside of this room. And we're participating in it, um, even if we're on kind of the right side of things. So how do you think about that? Do you think about that? So I think that's a, that's a very good question. And um, I think it, when you want to control variables, um, you need to first understand them. You need to measure them. And then later on, you can somehow make change happen to that also in the wider 
Web3 ecosystem. And I think this, the, the debate that we are seeing is very, this, this debate is fought very hard. Mm. And there is a lot, of, a lot of criticism on methodologies and on ideas and on, on uh, scientific reports out there. And I think we need to get to a point where we have a common view of how these networks work in terms of we are a lot quantifying like the E, the S, and the G, or that's what we're looking at. But also, like, there is hardly any quantification on what are the advantages, what we are talking about right here now. So what, are, what is the positive impact of a blockchain? And when we would be able to actually have these numbers, not only for Polkadot, but for any other cryptocurrency out there like Bitcoin, there are valid use cases in Bitcoin, like remittance, like people use this to mm -hmm. um, have, a, have a better way to send money home. And um, I think when we are able to quantify that, then we can actually um, make assumptions and, and talk about that if that is a technology that we should, um, that you, that we should um, engage with or that other people should engage with. And I think this is a discussion not only on the negative sides, but on the positive sides. We really yes. need to uh, nail the data down there, yeah. Right. To your point, focusing on the positive sense a bit more. Any other responses? Well, uh, maybe just uh, on quantifying, I think, yeah, you can only, uh, uh, I mean, it's very important to measure. So. Uh, to know if we are progressing in the right direction, we're going to need to measure more things and record more results. And I think for that, blockchain is great. What we do with a, a low energy wireless network by leveraging the existing smartphones, uh, radios of people is also a way to collect that information uh, more often, be able to, to actually have that data stored and then to provide more measurements. And uh, I, I believe that uh, we will live in a world at some point where everything will have a microprocessor or radio. So, uh, and that will eventually help us bring more efficiencies, but actually measure everything and know where we need to focus our energy to actually tackle this big problem of uh, global warming, for example. Right. And uh, until we don't get to that point where we are ready and we want to measure everything, then it's going to be very hard to actually take action. Any last words here? I'd quickly say, if the, <clears throat> if the question is, like, how do we do what we want to do while others are either <clears throat> ignoring, ignoring that type of work, or they're, doing, they're performing some action that is like, deleterious, <clears throat> I think like, it's incumbent on us to show that we can be larger, more scalable, more profitable, mm. more inspirational than like, making a, a JPEG monkey and then being able to sell that for nothing. Right. Because like, that's the easy thing to do, right? Like the easy, I don't think, maybe some people wake up in the morning and they're really inspired to make or trade monkeys, right? But Vitalik tweets and talks about this all the time as well. There are like real hard problems in the world. And there is a point like in the human psyche that these problems are just so large that we feel so disempowered and frustrated that we numb ourselves through distractions. The joke is like, we're the bored monkeys. Right, mm -hmm. like we're the board monkeys. So, but that's easy, and it's hard to do the hard things. So I think that the um, like the the primitive companies that are trying to do this in blockchain and elsewhere, Patagonia is clearly one. Like Tom's is one. Like many other organizations, <clears throat> because they decided to step front stage and do it. Mm. Right. It's also incumbent on them to show that there's a better way, and that also doing the hard things is rewarding, and it's worth worth the sacrifice and then you like you begin to change people's mentality like I don't instead of just eating my vegetables I'm supposed to eat my vegetables I'm doing it because I know that it's like it's so much better for myself and then when you're eating the vegetable when you're eating the vegetable and you're beginning to enjoy it it's actually broccoli can be really tasty then like then you don't want to eat the donut you're not focused on the donut you're focused on all the positive things that you're creating and here like Patagonia is an inspiration for other social entrepreneurs, right? And all those companies, right, we're the ones who stand on their shoulders in a sense. They inspired us. Mm. And then we need to be that beacon of hope and inspiration for others. I feel like that's, that's the, way to, the way to do it. We need to show that we can be larger, more scalable, more inspirational, have greater adoption, but doing it when like, the foundation of what we're building is informed by this idea of doing it right, right. from the very beginning. All right. I think that's a great note to end on. One question. Oh, I'm sorry. Who has a question? Right in front. Um, oh, I missed. Okay, yeah. please. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> yeah. I'm so no, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
for global warming, and I think... Oh, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, Gennaro Derso, CEO of Genetic Networks, and I'm creating PharmaDAO. Um, so one of the interesting things I, I, I resonate with is how do you get people together to solve really big problems, right? My question is sort of just basic, though, because I don't follow the um, climate issues as much as I, you know, would maybe should, but... But the question really is uh, triggered by Mitch's, uh, Mitch's uh, talk about using the phones as ways of measuring things. So what types of things could be measured by people? Because there's a lot of phones. <laughs> Everyone has one. And one of the things that came up a long time ago, I saw from a Nobel laureate who talked about this, he kind of um, raised the question of how do we measure temperature accurately Mm. on the earth. How do we come up with a global temperature average? And I'm a scientist, so I tend to be very accurate with my work, I hope. And it's a good question, right? We, we rely on some means to measure temperature. Do we put thermometers all over the earth in different spots? How do we get... And I think the only way we're really going to get people, the other side, let's say, to understand this and get behind it is that they actually believe the quantitative data that's being generated. And I know from being a scientist that that is probably the most critical thing in mm. our science, that people will argue all day long about whether something is accurate or not, whether it's statistically accurately you know, determined. So that's the question I really have is, how do we measure things with people in their phones? Because I like that concept, because they're there and it's cheap to do that. Mm -hmm. But the next big question is, how do, how do we really measure things like global temperature changes super accurately so people can actually believe what they're seeing, or what or people are trying to push? And you know it's a 50-50 debate, right? So it's gonna be really important to make it 60-40, or 70-30, right. if you want some change. Thank you, yeah, so. So we, we actually looked at the problem, um, and I agree that uh, measuring temperature is probably the basic first thing that we should, uh, we should do. Um, you, you can use smartphones for that, so you can uh, collect uh, local temperatures, and you can use uh, a Bluetooth low energy network like we, we activate on smartphones to connect to thermometers, which very often actually use the same technology, wireless technology, which is Bluetooth low energy. It's the same you use for your wireless headphones or speakers. And then you have a language uh, which is very well codified where you can query that information from some devices that have a thermometer or uh, devices that are just sole thermometers. So it's, uh, yeah, it's something that can be done. Uh, I mean, if there is anyone who wants to build this on our network and leverage the network, then they should come and talk to us. Yeah. When it comes to measuring uh, at a global level uh, and how to gather that information and be able to, to provide real uh, uh, data points, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a, really a, an idea or solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.